Let's get started. Well, thank you for being here. My talk is about the pros and cons of biparametric MRI versus multiparametric MRI in the detection of prostate cancer. First, I would like to acknowledge our sponsors of the ICIS, Siemens, Gerber, and Infinit, and also we are grateful to acknowledge Soteria Medical. Um, you can follow us, uh, ICIS, on social media, as you can see, and also uh, Professor Padani and I, we have personal Twitters and tweet accounts. So, um, these are my disclosures. Let's get started. What is multiparametric MRI? Multiparametric MRI consists of three techniques that help each other, as you can see here. The first technique is T2 weighted imaging that shows anatomy. Just like a drawing in black and white, you can see the structures of the prostate. This is a normal prostate with the peripheral zone being bright and some mixed signal intensity, the transition zone. Now, when we see a low signal area, this not only can be cancer, but also can be due to hematoma, prostatitis or BPH. Therefore, we need another technique to further differentiate. For this, we use diffusion weighted imaging that shows predominantly biology. DWI is showing the velocity of water molecules in between the cells. With high velocity, it's bright on the DWI images. And if there is a wide area in between the cells, there's a high velocity. However, when the cells are tightly packed, like for example in an aggressive prostate cancer, as you can see over here, the velocity is low. And on the ADC map, the apparent diffusion coefficient map, it is here, it is black. So black on the ADC map is probably an aggressive tumor. Now also we have contrast agent, the topic of this talk this afternoon. And with dynamic MRI, we see the vascularity, vascular flow and vascular permeability. In all structures where there is an increased flow, there is a bright structure on the DCE. And this is not only prostate cancer, but can also be seen in prostatitis and benign prostatic hyperplasia. This is the same cancer you've seen on the previous images. Now the three techniques, they make a diagnosis. What is the indication for prostate MRI? Um, prostate MRI is actually a risk stratification by using a standardized method. This is PIRATS. And PIRATS describes the assessment of the presence of a significant cancer. What is a significant cancer? Usually urologists consider a Gleason score three plus three that is in ISUP grade one as non-significant. And if there is a four component or higher, then it is a significant tumor. So ISUP grade two or higher is considered to be a significant cancer. What is the value of prostate MRI? At this moment, there are four level of 1A evidence papers that show that prostate MRI has a high value if you perform it prior to any biopsy. These are the three papers, Lancet, New England Journal, European Urology, and the Cochrane meta-analysis. Let's zoom in into the Cochrane analysis that summarizes the existing literature up to now. 20 studies, more than 5,000 papers. First, if you use multiparametric MRI in a negative MRI, you can avoid biopsy in one third of patients. This is at the cost of a missing of 8% significant cancers. 
Furthermore, there is a reduced overdiagnosis of 28 to 17 percent, which is quite significant. There is an equal detection of significant cancers, 28 percent to 29 percent. Now, if you look the four, at the 4M study, which is a head-to-head -head comparison in an expert center that studied over more than 600 patients, you can see that this, in this institution, 50% of patients had a negative MRI and could avoid biopsy. This was only at the cost of 3% of not detecting significant cancers, predominantly grade group two. Also, you see that there is an almost 50% reduction of overdiagnosis of insignificant cancers that usually leads to overtreatment with an equal detection of significant cancers. This is to summarize the value of prostate MRI over trust biopsy. You have less overdiagnosis of insignificant cancers and less delay of the right treatment because now you can do a targeted biopsy and you can hit the most aggressive part of the tumor. Therefore, the EAU guidelines in 2019 changed and they state that you should perform MRI before any biopsy. Well, this of course leads to a tsunami of prostate MRIs because all the patients that usually would have had a truss biopsy now will be referred to an MRI first. So the challenge is to actually conquer this tsunami. We can do this by optimizing reading, and we did as uh, optimizing of reading was done by creating pirates in 2012 and updates in 2016. The other challenge is to enable a good quality MRI. Unfortunately, not all MRIs are of adequate quality. Therefore, in European radiology, the ESUR and the EAU, European Society of Urological Imaging, published a consensus statement on MPMRI for the detection of clinically significant cancer. And they described quality requirements for acquisition, how to make a good image, and interpretation, and also some advice for radiologist training. Now, the other challenge is to focus on learning and certification. Fortunately, there are many courses, and now this, these courses are even replaced by webinars like this one. The next problem is how can we scan all these men? Well, the question is, can we stop contrast? Because that would speed up things enormously. I will come to that in a few minutes. So the question is, to DCE or not to DCE? That is the question. And this question is started to be answered already in one paper, the 4M paper, and I will come to that in a few minutes. And this talk will be about the pros and the cons of the use of contrast agent in prostate MRI. Now, what are the pros? You can reduce significantly the time of the image acquisition. Also, you can lower the direct costs. Similar, um, Dr. Padani, can you mute the microphone, please? Thank you. So, lower the direct cost. I will come to that in a few minutes. And the question is, is there a similar performance for the detection of significant cancer? And finally, we don't have to give contrast. There are some concerns of intravenous contrast injection because of the gadolinium brain deposits and nephrotoxicity. This is what you do with multiparametric MRI. All the sequences and you do two patients per hour. 
if you reduce DCE, you get speed up to three patients per hour. This is biparametric MRI. And if you also delete two of the T2 weighted sequences, so only in one plane, so a single plane biparametric MRI, you can do even four patients per hour. So fast MRI, four patients per hour. This is called the manogram. This is information if, of anatomy and with a superposition uh, of diffusion. So T2 and diffusion only. These are the protocols that are being advised by the Paris Steering Committee for multiparametric MRI. T2 weighted two or three planes. This is the resolution. Diffusion with a low B value, an intermediate and a high B value. The calculation of an ADC map and the calculation of a B1400 or higher image. And then finally, a DCE injection followed by T1 weighted six, uh, contrast images. So this is the time resolution, 15 seconds or faster. Total examination time more than 15 minutes, about 16 to 20 minutes. If you reduce here, Contrast, it's 30 minutes. And if you reduce two sequences, it's eight minutes. So if you then add the on and off table time, you have four images, four patients per hour. If you look at the direct costs, so not the costs that are also incur with the overdiagnosis reduction, but these are the direct imaging costs of multiparametric MRI versus three planes biparametric MRI versus monoplanar biparametric MRI, you can see that there is a significant cost reduction per MRI from 264 euros to 165 and to 121. This is the Dutch situation. And also there is an increased quality of life uh, for all the three techniques as compared to truss biopsy. Now, what are the cons? The question is, is biparametric MRI as accurate as multiparametric MRI? Is there perhaps a higher level of PIRAT3 diagnosis? And what about experience? So first, the accuracy. If you look at the accuracy of multiparametric MRI versus biparametric MRI, you can see that there is no significant difference in the negative predictive value and the detection of significant cancer. This is shown by the, by the Cochrane meta-analysis of Trust and colleagues. There is in some papers a lower sensitivity and higher specificity in head-to-head -head comparisons of multiparametric MRI versus biparametric MRI. This is one of the head-to-head -head comparisons. I mentioned it earlier, the 4M study. And here you can see the results of fast biparametric MRI versus biparametric MRI with three planes T2 and multiparametric MRI. You can see that biparametric MRI and multiparametric MRI are equal. However, if you use a fast biparametric MRI, you can see that there is an increase of men with a false positive diagnosis, so an increase of a false not needed biopsy in 2% and 1% increase of insignificant cancer detection. You also can see the reduction of imaging time from 16 minutes to eight minutes. So a 50% reduction. Now there is a recent meta-analysis in prostate appeared and uh, this is the most recent paper, Bras et al. show that the sensitivity of biparametric MRI is 84% and the specificity 75%. More interestingly, biparametric MRI has a comparable sensitivity and specificity. You can see here the sensitivity and specificity in the area of the curve of the both techniques in the detection of clinically significant cancer. So you would say, okay, this is it. We now all can do biparametric MRI 
instead of multi-parameter MRI. Well, this is not really true. The other conclusion of these authors was that there is a significant heterogeneity between all the studies. So there is a lack of randomized comparative data in biopsy, uh, in the biopsy population, biopsy need population. Furthermore, powered studies are needed to confirm the ability of biparametric MRI to address the disadvantages of multiparametric MRI without sacrificing the diagnostic efficacy with cost effectiveness evaluated. Other trials have shown that there is a higher level of pirate 3 diagnosis. I will come to that in a few minutes because this is important. There is a 50% upgrade. This will lead to many more men that have to undergo biopsy. This is the upgrade of the pirate 3s. And an additional approach need to be used to reduce the numbers of pirate 3 diagnosis by, for example, PSA density, the risk calculators, or the select MDX. So, what about PIRAT3? Is there a higher level of PIRAT3 without contrast? What does PIRAT3 mean? That is, I do not know. Does your urologist like when you have a report of an MRI of his patient and you say, I do not know? No, this is not good. So, we have to reduce PIRAT3 as much as possible. You can see that a PIRAT3 diagnosis can be upgraded to a PIRAT4 diagnosis if there is an early enhancement of the same area. You can also see in papers that there is a reduced uncertainty, there's less uncertainty in experienced radiologists. Now, this is a paper, this appeared in the New England Journal. This is the precision trial. And you can see all reads, so that is academic expert centers and the peripheral non-academic experts. And you can see that there is a gradual decrease of pirates two to three, and then it increases uh, sorry, uh, uh, two, four, and five. Oops, I have to go back. But what most important is, is that there is, with the central readers, so the experts, they have a pirate three percentage of 6% versus 21% of the non-experts. Also, if you calculate the uncertainty, the increase of uncertainty, according to, for example, the 4M head-to-head -head comparison study, you see that an expert increases his uncertainty by not using contrast from 6 to 11 percent. Well, that's not too bad, isn't it? However, if your uncertainty already is 25 percent, so if you are a non-expert, this increases to almost 50 percent of the MRIs. So, in a non-expert, not using contrast, in about 50%, the radiologist is telling, I do not know. Is that what we want? No. Now, another con, and I came to that already, is experience matters. Here you can see that if you have expertise reading 300 cases with multi-parametric MRI, you have an area under the curve of 86% already. This is acquired in 1,000 patients if you only read the biparametric MRI. So you need a lot more cases, a lot higher expertise to be able to have the same area under the curve. Furthermore, if you continue to use multi-parametric MRI, you can see that your final area under the curve is higher as compared to when you use contrast. So, experience matters. This is diffusion weighted imaging, velocity of water molecules. This is T2. Here you can see the structure, anatomy. And this is DCE. DCE helps you to guide your car into this parking lot. Now, sometimes it's easy. This is the case in a large pirate's five lesion. 
And for those cases, you do not need MR, uh, DCE, no contrast. This is easy. Well, you, you, you don't have that much expertise to park your car. However, it becomes different when you have a parking lot like this. Then you need to have a parked assist system. So then you do need to use contrast. This is a case that happened to me. 74 year old man, PSA high, DRE zero, one time negative plus systematic biopsy. T2 axial image, T2 sagittal image, B1400 and ADC. Now I would like to know your diagnosis. Can you please open the poll if possible? Okay. So please give me your diagnosis. No lesion, pirate one to two, pirate three, pirate four to five in a transition zone, and pirates four to five in the peripheral zone. Please make your vote. Give you a few seconds. Go back to the images. Oops. So these are the images. T2, B1400, ADC, and the sagittal. Yeah, here you have the images. Can you see them? Okay. I think now the, uh, the votes have been shared. Uh, most of you said, can we see the images? Okay. So most of you said uh, pirates four to five in the transition zone. Um, then the second was uh, one to two. So no abnormality. Well, benign prostatic hyperplasia. And you're correct, this is BPH. Okay, let's continue. Whoops, so. Now I'm using contrast. What is your diagnosis now? Please, can we have the vote again? Can you please re-vote? So the same answers, please. Is that possible? Oh yeah, here they are. So I'll give you a few minutes. So you have now the contrast enhanced image as well. What now is your diagnosis? Is it bias one to two? Is it a lesion in the transition zone? Or a lesion in the peripheral zone that is significant cancer? I wonder whether you can make a diagnosis. Actually, I said before contrast pirate one to two, so negative. And as we still use routinely contrast, can you see, the, can you show the results? Okay, now 75%. So most of you said this is a lesion in the peripheral zone. Well, very good. Here it is. And now if you go back to the other images, you can see the lesion here. You can see a slight focal area, which is not really black, so white and black. So the score is a four for T2, a plus for DCE, because this is an early enhancing lesion, which is comparable to a lesion on the other sequences, a three for diffusion, because this is white, and not black. Now, if you now look to the scheme, it is a Pirate 4 because it, it is a diffusion, which is the dominant sequence in the peripheral zone, which is upgraded by contrast. So this makes it a Pirate 4. So without contrast, we would have missed this lesion. We performed an inbore biopsy, MR targeted, and it showed a very aggressive Gleason 4 plus 4 lesion. Patient had prostatectomy, which confirmed a lesion confined to the prostate, Gleason 4 plus 4, and until now the patient does not have any metastasis and is in good health. Okay, when to use contrast? Well, actually, let's start when not to use contrast. So when can we consider to use bipermetic MRI? If there is a low risk, an early detection population, for example, when there is a low risk of prostate cancer, you can consider in not using contrast. Because in that 
population, you're not likely to expect something and it, it's not really needed. The other thing, oops, okay, I want to use contrast, oops. Um, so when there is a high risk of significant cancer, so when it's likely that there is something there which you will not miss with the other sequences, don't use contrast. And also you can consider to use contrast on demand. That means you are performing no contrast MRI and you, well, you have in your back of your head that in some percentage of your patients, you have to bring the patient back. If that is not a problem, then you can consider in being quite flexible in not giving contrast. There are also institutions who have a radiologist on spot. It's quite time consuming and quite, well, not that effective. Uh, and he directly decides whether the patient needs to have contrast or not. We're not, we're not doing that. Now, when should you use contrast? When is actually multiparametric MRI mandatory? When there is a previous negative biparametric MRI with persisting clinical suspicion, you really want to detect the aggressive tumor because it's likely to be there. When there is a poor image quality, for example, by diffusion weighted artifacts, for example, a hip prosthesis or air in the rectum. Um, and when there is, of course, a low level of expertise, when you're not that good yet in prostate MRI, please consider to use contrast. Now the question is, has the biparametric area come? Well, the answer is be careful. This is the advice of the Pirate Steering Committee published in the AGAR recently. Now, non-contrast MRI, it is a potential for the increase in demand of prostate MRI. That's being recognized by the Pirate Steering Committee. However, you need to have top image acquisition, very good images and good radiologists. That is mandatory. You should consider, as mentioned earlier, to recall the patient when the image poor quality is bad or when you have a Pirate 3. And finally, also the Pirate Steering Committee advises to collect greater evidence to define which patient groups will benefit from contrast enhancement and which groups will not. Take home message, biparametric MRI requires expertise. This is very important. Multiparametric MRI helps to find a significant cancer, as you have seen in the case that I showed in this presentation. It also reduces the uncertainty. And this is a paper in European urology where it, well, we, have, we, we give some advice how to optimize the images. You need to have a good quality image if you consider in deleting contrast. There need to be a quality assessment and your quality control. You need to know how good you are. And you need to have training and preferably be certified. Be careful if you omit contrast. And if you follow Hamlet by not to be, because finally he committed suicide. So by not using contrast, not to DCE, please remember, DCE helps to find a tumor. DCE is reducing uncertainty and DCE is very helpful in less experienced radiologists. Another warning, I can't warn enough because I see in my country that too many radiologists are not using contrast because it speeds up things. You can do three per hour, it's easy. No contrast before and after contrast images, no comparison. It looks simple, but please consider that if you are a starter with not yet enough training, you may harm the patient. Don't do this when you don't have driver's license. DRE, this is the finger of the urologist. And this is the warning finger. 
determine your radiological expertise. If you consider in not using contrast, I have an advice. And my advice is look at the images without contrast. Write down your diagnosis. Then look at the images with contrast and write down your diagnosis. And then see if you, when you do this for a couple of weeks, if you see a difference. If you don't see a difference, you may consider in not using contrast. But you need to be sure of good quality and you need to be sure that the patient is in the appropriate category, as I told before, to omit contrast. Well, this was my talk. Um, next year, the International Cancer Imaging Society will have a very few, well, a, a few very good speakers. It is uh, Professor Padani, Professor Mu, uh, and Professor Sala, and they will show you the abbreviated MRI protocol on prostate, liver, and kidney. You can see my website. You can see website and you can see my email address. So if you have unanswered questions after question and answers, please let me know. And Dr. Padani will now guide you through the questions. Whenever you have a question, please type it and I will try to answer it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. That was great. Um, we've already had a few questions come in. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, one of the questions that came in and that came to my mind is this whole point of taking pool data to make treatment recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of any studies that have done head-to-head -head comparisons in a randomized fashion to, to be able to not look at diagnosis but you know more outcomes um, the rates of clinically uh, significant and insignificant cancer rates I just wondered if you've seen any literature on that subject well it is a good question and I, I'm afraid I, I haven't seen I haven't seen them and well the person who knows most about literature and and the, the evaluation of the literature that of course is professor badani himself so he's asking the question actually to himself and i will ask you the question anvar did you see a paper that i may have missed i don't think they are there so the recommendations i make today are a little bit on uh, what we call in dutch on loose sand still you have to walk on loose sand and it's not a swamp Fortunately, but there are some uncertainties and don't expect to, to to have a very high speed on loose sand. It still is difficult. We have to get out of it. So what is absolutely needed is a prospective trial, which also includes head to head comparisons. And that is what we need. Um, there are a few papers and they give an indication, but I want to have a paved road and not too much loose sand. I hope I more or less answer that question. Nonetheless, we have to we have to be on our way. We can't stop. So loose sand already is something. It's better than swamp or water. Yes. Uh, so so Yeli, if you give contrast mm -hmm. and you see something, yeah. is it more likely or less likely that the lesion that you see is going to be a higher grade, equivalent grade, or a lower grade? than just a DWI T2 by itself? That's a very good question. And uh, that, that actually refers to the, the, the specificity and the differentiation between aggressive cancer and yes. non-aggressive cancer. And if you would ask the question between normal and cancer, it's, it is more or less easy. DC is good because something that enhances has the likelihood to be cancer or inflammation. However, the differentiation uh, between a, a low-grade cancer and, and a high-grade cancer based on DCE is rather difficult. For that, you need to have more detailed information about the wash in, the wash out, the area under the curve. So you can quantify your contrast injection, but that is, well, that is a little bit high-class DCE. Yeah. With a regular DCE, if something enhances earlier, there is an indication that this maybe a more aggressive cancer. 
for me, it is an identification. This enhances. I look at the lesion that enhances, and then I go back to the DWI and say, okay, is this black and white on the um, ADC map and on the B1400? And if yes, okay. And just like the case I've shown before, I, I, I completely missed it. So this is one of the things. The other things is that if you use contrast, an early enhancement of an, a focal area to upgrade a three to a four, then there is rationale, but it's not 100%. You're not absolutely sure that based on just simple early enhancement, the tumor is, well, definitely be an aggressive, uh, aggressive cancer. So you need to be careful, but it gives an indication. For the transition zone, if you have a lesion that is abnormal at T2, that's the dominant sequence, um, and has a black and white, so high ADC, my experience is that when it enhances early, it's likely to be a very bad guy, a four plus three or higher. And when it does not enhance, then it may be a three plus three and a three plus four. So there also is some help. But for the real good differentiation, again, you need the quantification. Air you know the curve, wash in, wash out. So we're not recommending that straight away. Well, you, you can do wash in, wash out area under the curve, but it, 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 it requires expertise. You need to very, very um, precisely monitor your contrast injection. You need to have some software tools that either calculate the arterial input or make a correction for the arterial input. So it is, it is, it is more difficult. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult. And the pilot steering committee clearly said, for the broad MRI contrast uh, users in, 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 of prostate MRI, we need to keep it simple. And when it's simple, of course, the value of contrast with respect to the specificity is lower. So Yeli, another question that's come up is, so the, when a patient presents to you with an elevated PSA, it could be a benign cause or a malignant cause. Mm -hmm. Now we say we don't need, we may not need DCE to detect a malignant cause. But what about diagnosing the benign causes of a raised PSA? Because that's the question. The question is, there's two questions. One is, is this is the raised PSA due to cancer, not cancer? Mm -hmm. then if it is, if you don't think it is, then what is it? That's yeah. the problem. So yeah. what, about yeah. the, what about the use of DCE for diagnosing benign? conditions that, that, is a, that is that is a very good question um and 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 of course if you have an elevated psa um only only 25 percent of the patient has an aggressive tumor so the rest does not it's either an insignificant cancer or it is a bph or it is prostatitis and 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 here you come for prostatitis if you have difficulties in recognizing prostatitis on t2 which is sometimes really difficult, then contrast is really helpful. When I see a smudgy, rather, well, low signal intensity area of the peripheral zone, then I'm very happy if my DCE confirms enhancement because then I know if it's not black and or white on the DWI images, and if it's not focal, then contrast confirms my impression that this is prostatitis. So, for prostatitis, it may really help. And also cellular BPH, it, it may be very, very helpful. Yes, so yes, it may help. Um, if you have broad experience in recognizing prostatitis, the use of contrast is a little bit more reduced. I hope that answers the question. The question that's come up, and I think this relates to your your comment that you need to be highly expert to be able to use BPMRI consistently. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, a lot, a lot of people are not from high volume centers and, but they do have access. They, they, they will soon have access to other tools such as AI instruments mm -hmm. that will, as it were, boost their experience. So do you think that having AI and from what I understand, there are three, um, 
three of them that, that, that have recently got FDA approval, uh, that is, are those going to be able to boost your experience enough so, so that you can start using BP MRI rather than NP MRI? And that, will that justify the cost of spending money on the AI tool? Um, that is a, that is a very good, good question. Um, and of course I cannot look into the crystal ball. Um, you're looking at it with BP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll, 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 when I've if put contrast into the crystal ball, will I get a clear vision of what ha will happen in the future? I, I, well, AI at this moment, um, is at its early stages and although there are already a few companies that are FDA approved or they still are very early and you really should look what that AI can do. My experience is, is that yes, it can differentiate the transition from the peripheral zone, which is already a great help for many radiologists because the entire pirates assessment is depending on that differentiation. But is AI already good enough to recognize with high accuracy a clinically significant cancer and with not too many false positives? Well, I think that that's um, a question. the question is, does it boost your performance? Does it use your, your, your performance? Um, I am a little bit reluctant. Um, I think you should train and, and, and you should not let the computer train itself. You need to be able to recognize things. Well, the question is, if, if you sit in an airplane, and we hardly sit in airplanes, airplanes these days, but if you sit in an airplane and you have a pilot which is well, not that much experienced, and now you have the automatic pilot, the AI pilot, say, well, this AI will boost me. Will you jump on that plane? Okay. This metaphor is actually the same, but it's not you who's jumping on the plane, but the patient and the patient's life is at stake. And I would say, boost your experience first, then consider to use AI because then you know what AI is doing wrong and does doing right. In the future, perhaps AI will solve the issue. Perhaps in the future, AI will obviate the use of contrast agents. Um, I think also in the, in the, in the FDA um, uh, approval, uh, I think contrast is not, not, not considered, is it? So AI is not trained with contrast. That's also, well, something which you should keep in your mind when you consider AI. So AI, yes, I'm happy to try it, but for my patients, no way at this moment. So another question came up that, so we, we, we do MRI for, for detecting cancers, but when you have a cancer, we have to stage it as well. Mm -hmm. And then isn't the DC helpful for looking at extra prostatic disease and seminal vesicle invasion? And wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be counted as an extra benefit? Um, well, yes, there is, there is, well, it is the same message. There are a few papers from some time ago that say that when you are not a top expert, contrast may help you in the staging performance. Um, What's your view? My view is, yes, it, it, it may help, but, but the limitation of staging is, is not that we are not recognizing gross invasion. Um, it's, it's not that we can exclude it when there is absolutely nothing, but it, it's those indeterminate cases where there is one or two cell layer of invasion. The question is, is there enough inflammation around it to help you to recognize that? So I'm, I'm not sure whether, whether it is useful for staging. Um, it perhaps may be. In seminal vesicle infiltration, it can be very helpful um, if you see a darkening on T2, it's not always, well, most of the times it's, it's not even invasion into the seminal fascicles unless it's asymmetric. But even in asymmetric darkening of the seminal fascicle on T2, it's, it's not always cancer. 
if you have also black and white on diffusion, it's really helpful. But in those cases in between, where there is a little bit of blackening on diffusion and a little bit blackening on T2, if you see an asymmetric enhancement of that area of the seminal fascicle, then you can say, okay, this is a stage T3B. There is most likely to be invasion. So the answer is yes, it may be helpful. Don't forget that that in the in the groups of patients that I in my talk advised where contrast should be used uh, used are the patients for early detection where there is hardly any significant disease present. So in those patients, staging not yet is a question because they are not even patients with cancer. Yes, there's one other question that's come through is. You know, there are some special cancers that occur within the prostate gland. So, for example, the very rare central zone cancers. Mm -hmm. And the not so rare anterior fibromuscular stromal tumors. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a subset value for DCE for those particular types of tumor? I think the answer is uh, yes. Um, in the anterior fibromuscular stroma, when you see enhancement within the dark area on the T2, then you should be very careful in not calling in, in you should be very careful in calling it an AFS. Uh, sometimes I, I I give you advice when you have AFS, it is dark on T2, it is dark on diffusion, and it's dark on DCE. When you have a cancer in the anterior fiber muscular stroma, it can be dark on T2, but usually it's a little bit higher signal intensity. Of course, diffusion will be black on ADC, anyhow, but the B1400 in a tumor in the AFS is white, whereas it is rather dark in non-AFS. So there it is intermediate white on the B1400 and also white on contrast. So when it's not dark, 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 but dark, a little bit dark, white, white, then it's likely to be a, a AFS tumor or a tumor invading from the transition zone to the AFS. Um, similarly, if you see in the central zone enhancement, that may be an indication for tumor because usually, well, most, most of the times, the transition zone is not enhancing. So yes, a very good question. I think there, and there are hardly any, any reports on, on that, but I think, yes, this, this is a very, um, very good indication for, uh, for contrast. So if you see something like that, and if you're not sure, you can bring the patient back. What about these central zone tumors? I mean, they're, they're quite rare. Yeah. Um, I don't think many of us have experience with those tumors. How many of the tumors have you seen over in your life? <laughs> one, sorry, one or two. That, that so, so and, 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 and uh, I've seen thousands of patients. So it, it, it is just right. a question, which is for most of us not relevant. But okay. I think, I think contrast may, may be of help. Okay, so there was another question that came up is this prostatitis issue. Mm -hmm. If you see this diffuse change in the peripheral zone, you call it prostatitis. But when you do the biopsy, there's no inflam inflammatory change there. Then what is it? If it's, you know, it looks, you know, like when we look at it, it looks like prostatitis, but it's not there when you do a, a biopsy. What is that change due to? Well, it's it, it, my only, the only thing with, with, with passes into my mind is, is and, and I haven't thought about it before, is, is this, this may be a variation of, of, of the normal yeah. prostate. Because a normal prostate in the young, young man um, is not white. It, 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 actually, the whitening of the prostate is due to cystic degeneration. The peripheral zone is showing more and more cells with fluids and the, 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 the ducts are more and more filled with fluid. So there's less normal tissue. Okay. When there is some remnant of still normal prostate tissue, I would th think that there actually may be more enhancement relative to the abnormal area, which is not enhancing. So it is the unenhancing part in that case that is actually not as normal as the enhancing part. And I'm not sure, but I think that patients who are on um, 
uh, hormonal therapy, uh, so uh, testosterone therapy, they also will have a very bright prostate. Yeah. So you, you I, some of that could be this asymmetric cystic atrophy. Yes, about. yes, yes, most probably. Yeah. Okay, so there was another question that came through. And that was, can you say something about the use of DCE for other indications? So you talked about detection, you talked about a helpfulness for staging. But what about for after focal therapy or in the um, recurrent setting? Yeah, uh, actually that's, that is a very good question. Uh, you can have the, the, uh, the active surveillance, so the monitoring of access, active surveillance where MRI is more or more used for the evaluation whether there is a deterioration of the tumor. So when, when there will be a four component, uh, let's, let's start with active surveillance. Um, you have the four techniques and whenever there is a change in one of the three techniques, that's what I learned from you, Anvar, you should call it an indication for biopsy. So either it gets larger or the ADC value goes down. So more tightly packed cells, or when there is a change in enhancement, that the area is enhancing earlier and more as compared to the previous image. I think that is an indication for, for biopsy. So contrast may be helpful there. Um, um, what about the then, recurrence? Then the recur in the recurrent setting, yes, there contrast is one of the most important sequences, uh, as in, in prostatitis, you don't have a prostate anymore. So you should expect no enhancement. Whenever there is a nodule which is enhancing, it's pathologic. And I always use contrast in the whole gland treatment recurrent setting. An enhancing lesion post prostatitis is likely to be a recurrence. In, whole gland radiotherapy, you expect that the, the, the prostate in, in one year time is decreasing in signal because of atrophy and fibrosis. Whenever there is an area and also vascularity goes down, not in the, in the initial phase, but in the, well, late phase, say after one half, well, six months to one year. Um, when you see a focal area, which is enhancing, it is also likely to be a recurrence. So for whole plant therapy, enhancement is very important in the recurrent setting. And in focal therapy, it is also the sequence which sometimes is the sequence to find the tiny area of recurrence or residual uh, tumor tissue, just like the small tumor, the Gleason 4 plus 4, which I showed in, in my talk. If there is a tiny area, poof, yes. So use it. Okay. So let, let me just see. I think we've got another five minutes. If there are any other mm -hmm. kinds of questions, I mean, there are some technical questions about, you know, the retrospective analysis of the Promise study. I'm not sure that we need to talk about that. I think that's too technical. Uh, uh, yes, I, I can advise uh, the, 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 the persons who asked that question to look at the paper in European Urology. Um, we wrote a review, as you are aware, uh, on, or, or an editorial on the promise. Thus, promise fulfills its promise, uh, the use of contrast agents. So, so there we summarize again um, some of the caveats of, of that study and some of the caveats of the use of contrast versus non-contrast. So read that paper, it's European Urology, an editorial. Okay, I don't see any other major questions that are, uh, that are in the, I mean, there are lots of like complimentary uh, comments for you. I think uh, with five minutes to, I think we can um, finish the seminar. I'd just like to thank everybody for, uh, for, um, for, um, attending today. I think it's been very successful. I think we've had more than 150 people watching online. Uh, don't forget to complete your webinar feedback, which um, everybody will be sent a link. And I've already seen uh, mine that's already come up. Um, if you have any any specific questions, please continue to send them in. Uh, and then Yeli will answer it, not me. Him. Uh, <laughs> he volunteered for this job. So, um, and I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, particularly Sorteria for this particular webinar, 
but also the ICIS uh, general sponsors. Thank you very much for attending. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Well done.